Well, good morning to all of you. <laughs> One of the most inspiring sights of convocation is to see Guruji's spiritual family gathered together like this. We look forward to it every year. And we hope that each one of you will feel the joy and the spiritual strength that can come from making this united effort to absorb Guruji's teachings and to deeply think of God. And as we begin this morning's satsang, let's just take a moment to quietly turn the mind toward God and Gurus, to feel that they are in this room and in our hearts. Because everything that we receive here really comes through their blessings and our own inner receptivity. So that's where we want our attention to be, on God and Gurus. Well, we have been told that life is really a how-to-live school. <laughs> and we're blessed to have a wonderful teacher in our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda. And we have textbooks full of divine wisdom in his writings. And then there's also the laboratory part of the course. <laughs> As most of you have already discovered, studying Guruji's teachings is very much a matter of learning by doing. And that's what the questions in this morning's satsang are about. About taking his guidance and seeing how we can put it into practice in the various kinds of situations and challenges that arise in our daily lives and in our sadhana. So our first question is from a devotee who says, Lately, one thing after another seems to be going wrong in my life. <laughs> I guess that sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> the company I work for had to cut back and I lost my job. Now there are so many bills coming in, and my husband is facing some serious health problems. It's just too much. Sometimes I find myself getting angry with God for allowing these things to happen. I know I shouldn't think that way, and I feel bad about it, but sometimes it seems so unfair. Well, in the challenging times that we are passing through, I think so many people are facing these kinds of circumstances. And probably a number of you have been in situations where you could wholeheartedly agree with this statement, which was made by a very saintly soul. Lord, I know you won't give me anything I can't handle, but I wish you didn't trust me so much. <laughs> but when we're in a situation like that, Let's not add to our burden by feeling bad about feeling bad. <laughs> because we don't need to get down on ourselves just because we don't respond to every situation with flawless even-mindedness. That's human. <laughs> and perfection is not a prerequisite for following the spiritual path. That's a relief, isn't it? <laughs> so we need to know that God and Guru know what we're going through and that they feel for us. Guruji himself had many financial uncertainties in building this work. He went through many different kinds of difficulties. And so he knows what it's like. And he has also shown us that our trials are not meant to make us feel discouraged or defeated. On the contrary, they're meant to bring out strength and inner understanding that we may not have even known we had. Guruji said, you are immortal, your trials are mortal. You can unleash infinite powers and shatter your finite trials. Sometimes we forget our infinite nature and we need to discover it again. And that's really what it's all about. Master said, the magnificent painting of creation stretches across the infinite canvas of time and space. But from our present human point of view, how much of that painting are we actually seeing? Maybe a square inch, maybe a little less? 
And if you imagine yourself standing in front of a huge painting and only being able to see one square inch, is that going to make any sense to you? Probably not. Because you don't see what purpose that fragment has in the whole picture. And it's the same way with our experiences. We may not see what purpose they have in the overall life of our soul and in what ways they're meant to bring us closer to God. So no wonder we're confused. And when with our human understanding alone we can't figure out why things are happening the way they are, then what do we do? Well, basically we have two choices. We can resist and resent. And sometimes that's our first reaction, especially if something feels unfair. But if we go down that road, sooner or later we find out that it's a dead-end street. Because you just get more discouraged, more frustrated. And when that happens, you end up cutting yourself off from other people and from God. You don't want to do that to yourself. So what is the other alternative to put our trust in the one who does see the whole picture? To accept what has happened and to say, all right, Lord, I may not like this, I may not understand it, but help me to go on, help me to see what it is I need to learn. And when we're hurting, it's not always easy to take that step of surrendering and trusting but it's absolutely vital if we want to go forward because that's what opens the door to all the help and the blessings we need and that puts us in touch with the source of all abundance. Of course, it's not a matter of just saying a prayer once or twice. We know that we need to really keep that connection with God open so that we can be receptive to his help. And meditation is most important in doing that. And the ironic thing is that sometimes when we are going through many difficulties, that's the very time when we're tempted not to meditate. Or we're tempted to cut our meditation short. We feel, I'm just too restless, I'm too worried, I'm too busy, I just can't do it. But that's the very time when we need it the most when we need that calmness and that perspective that meditation brings, and when we need that reassurance of being connected with God, that connection with the source of our being. And so promise yourself that when you're in this kind of situation, you will take time to meditate, no matter how restless you are. Guruji said, Since God is the source of all mental power, peace and prosperity, Do not will and act first, but contact God first. Having made that contact, then you can pull out all the stops (laughs) and do whatever you need to do in daily life to solve those problems. And that, of course, includes using our will and being willing to consider many different options, being creative about it, and also absolutely refusing to give up. Master said, no matter what happens, if you have unalterably resolved, the earth may be shattered, but I will keep doing the best I can. You are using dynamic will, and you will succeed. And you can just imagine Guruji saying that to you with all the force of his dynamic will. One way to keep ourselves from getting overwhelmed is to take one step at a time not brooding about the past or worrying about the future too much, just doing what needs to be done right now. Another way is to remember Guruji's advice not to dwell on any problem constantly. Because what you dwell on all the time, that becomes bigger and bigger in your consciousness. So that's why it's much better to practice the presence of God than the presence of your problems. So if we take these steps, if we trust God, and if we put forth every effort we can, then we will get through these difficult times in our lives. And we will find that we have grown through them. 
It's pretty easy to be positive when everything's going well, isn't it? And it's easy to love God and to trust Him when our prayers are being answered. But if we still try to do that, even in the midst of trials, then we're learning some of the deepest lessons that there are on the spiritual path. Lessons in faith and in unconditional love. And when you do that, that takes you to a whole new level in your relationship with God. Now, having heard that, you might think, my goodness, isn't there an easier way (laughs) to learn what we need to learn? Actually, no. (laughs) Our president, Sri Dayamata, once said, strength, willpower, faith, all these muscles are developed when one is forced to use them. So never think that if life were less difficult for you, it would be easier to know God because that is not true. And I read a little story that reminded me of this. It was about a biologist who was working with butterflies, and one day he was watching an emperor butterfly trying to get out of its chrysalis, and it was really struggling. And he wondered what would happen if he would help the process along a little bit. So he slid open the chrysalis to make it easier for the butterfly to get out. And it emerged, and it spread its wings, and it drooped perceptibly, and then it died. And the biologist could only conclude that without the pain and the intensity of the struggle, that butterfly simply did not have the strength to live, to survive. And it's really that way with us. Our trials have a hidden purpose. They are meant to bring out our strength. And they are meant to draw us closer to God, to help us to be free. As Master tells us, such experiences are but the shadow of Divine Mother's hand outstretched caressingly. Don't forget that. When trouble comes, don't think that she is punishing you. Her hand overshadowing you holds some blessing as it reaches out to draw you closer to her. That's a comforting thought during these times, isn't it? That Divine Mother is drawing us closer to her. The next question is about something that we never have enough of, time. (laughs) This devotee says, In the Self-Realization Fellowship lessons, Guruji tells us to practice meditation long and with intensity. How can the average person who has to earn a living, care for children, and cope with many responsibilities manage this? How does one deal with the limits on one's time imposed by the realities of life in a complex world? I think we can all relate to what this devotee is saying because whether we are householders or monastics, many of us have multiple responsibilities and a pretty full schedule. And sometimes we wonder why the Lord didn't make the day at least a few hours longer so that we could get it all in. But one thing we need to remember when we read anything in Guruji's writings is that he often spoke of what would be ideal for us to do. And he certainly wanted to set our hearts hearts on fire to meditate more. At the same time, he was very balanced and very practical. And he wants us to do what is feasible within our own circumstances, without neglecting our daily duties or without neglecting our family responsibilities. And it's reassuring that his teachings are actually a special dispensation for this age. So they are meant to give us that assurance that in spite of the many demands on our time, we can find God. Now, he didn't say it would be easy. He said we would have to work at it. But one thing he would want every single one of us to remember, and that is nothing external can ever prevent you from knowing God. If what we needed right now 
was an unlimited time to meditate so that we might make the quickest spiritual progress. Then we would be in a Himalayan cave. (laughs) But the fact that we are here instead indicates that there's something in our present circumstances that we need in order to gain spiritual strength and to progress on the spiritual path. So if we can look at it that way, rather than thinking of it as an obstacle, then we will make the quickest progress. As Guruji told us, God counts generously the merits of the devotee's heart and striving. So amidst all of the stresses of daily life, how do we go about finding enough time for God, enough time for meditation? Well, first of all, we can think about, are there some ways I can simplify my life? Now, that doesn't mean you become a recluse and cut out all recreation and relaxation and so on, because that's part of the balanced life, too. But maybe we need to look at some of the fillers in our life to ask ourselves, do I watch too much TV? Or do I get too engrossed in the internet? Or do I maybe have a habit of just taking on too many things, more than I can possibly do? If you really make a list, you will probably find that there are things that you can cut out or that you can cut down on in order to have more time for the vital priorities in your life. Another point to keep in mind is that it's quality time that counts. Quality time counts with people, and it also counts with God. So maybe we need to worry less about the time that we don't have, and instead to think more about how we can best use the time that we do have in order to really give our undivided attention to God. One way is to get hold of the mind right away before it has a chance to wander off. Guruji said, My mind used to be very restless, but now it is just like fire. As soon as I put my mind at the Christ Center, all thoughts are gone. Breath, heart, and mind are instantly still, and I am aware only of spirit. As soon as I put my mind at the Christ Center, all thoughts are gone. That's what we are aiming for. And even if we haven't reached that state of perfect concentration yet, we can start where we are by, as soon as we meditate, making sure that we consciously set aside those other concerns and that we don't allow those other thoughts in. And it takes an act of will until it becomes natural to you. Diamataji has told us, It is vital that you so discipline yourself that simply by using your willpower, you can throw out of your mind every mundane preoccupation and say truly, nothing exists for me now but God. Isn't that what we would do if we were meditating with Master, even for a few minutes? So make your meditation your appointment with Him. It's important, too, that we not underestimate what we can gain by making the most of the short periods of time that we have available. Sometimes we may tend to have an all-or-nothing consciousness. And we think, well, I only have 10 minutes, and I really can't go deep in 10 minutes anyway, so it's not worth trying. (laughs) Actually, it's very much worth it. You'd be surprised how deep you can go in just a few minutes, if you really give that time to God. And sometimes we focus even more intently when we know that all we have is just a little bit of time. And those few minutes can be crucial in helping us to keep regularity in our spiritual routine, even at those times when our schedule is very, very pressed. And that's important because with the meditation techniques, in a way, it's just like practicing an instrument, a musical instrument. If you stay away from it completely for a couple of weeks, and then you come back to it again, it feels like you're starting all over. And you have to work up to that same point again. 
Isn't that what happens with our meditations when they get sporadic? And so using those short periods of time and really being creative about looking for them, that can help you to keep that spiritual momentum going and to really experience the benefits that come from that regular contact with God. Another way that we can learn to commune with God despite a less than ideal schedule is to practice his presence. We know that Guruji lived in that consciousness and he also told us, cultivate the will to think of God during activity. It only takes a moment to say, I love you or thank you, Lord, or to say, help me, bless me. We just have to remember to do it. And you can use whatever works for you, either a brief affirmation or some, some of the words of a favorite chant, or even as Guruji said, just saying the name of God creates a vibration that evokes the presence of God. And don't worry if you don't feel anything at first. It's something that you need to practice and get used to. And then it becomes easier And if you do that during the day, you will find that when you get to your meditation in the evening, your mind will already be there with God. You won't have to bring it back from a million miles away. The great 17th century Saint Brother Lawrence practiced the presence of God to such an extent that he got to the point where he didn't feel any difference whether he was kneeling at the altar in the monastery chapel or if he was in the kitchen picking up a straw from the floor. And the blessings of practicing the presence of God are not just for great saints and those who live in monasteries. They have been experienced by people of every walk of life who have practiced it sincerely. I remember reading about someone who decided to practice the presence of God as he was commuting to work on the train. And he started out with just 10 minutes. It took a while for him to get used to it. And then he gradually increased the time until finally he was able to do it for the entire commute, which was close to an hour. And the first time he was able to do this, he said that when he got to the destination, he felt such inner joy that he had to pray, Lord, please help me to get my feet on the ground again. I have to go to work. (laughs) So there are ways to keep our consciousness with God. It doesn't so much matter what we're doing or where we are, but where the mind is. He is everywhere. And this challenge of finding time to meditate and to think of God is certainly not a new one. And we each have to find the balance that works for us. Dayama once brought this same issue to our guru when she was a young disciple. She said, I remember Guruji standing in the hallway upstairs, giving me many instructions as to what he wanted done. And he concluded by saying, and don't forget to meditate. (laughs) And she says, I said, Master, how on earth can I do it? How can I keep my mind with God? I expected some profound, miraculous flow of wisdom from his lips. But all he said to me was, yes, I understand. I said the same thing to my master and <laughs> and he said to me the same thing I say to you. <laughs> you have to keep on trying, you have to keep on yearning, to keep on wanting. And that's what he would say to each one of us. We have to keep trying, we have to keep yearning, we have to keep wanting. And we need to keep that desire for God alive by making use of the time that we do have and by keeping him close in our thoughts. The next question is from a devotee who says, people sometimes tell me that I am taking myself and life in general too seriously. But it is hard not to, especially when there's so much to be concerned about in the world. 
I have been told that I should lighten up. How do I learn how to do that? <laughs> well, we know that there's plenty to be concerned about in the world. But our trouble is usually that we get so identified with the whole drama, and especially with our own part in it, that everything becomes weighty and momentous, and we start feeling like we're carrying the whole world on our shoulders. And then when that happens, and something doesn't go according to plan, we get really upset. And so if we find that happening to us, then it may be that our perspective needs some adjusting. I recall that over the years, whenever ch some challenging situation has arisen in Master's work, Diamataji's typical reaction is, well, it's your show, Lord. I'm just doing the best I can. She always puts forth a thousand percent effort, but she never forgets who's in charge. And she has also shared with us something that she read that is a little reminder of what the Lord might say to us if he were to put his guidance on this subject in writing. Do not feel totally, personally, irrevocably responsible for everything. That's my job. And it's signed, Love God. <laughs> our job is just to do the best we can in our own little corner of the world, to brighten it up as much as we can by positive thoughts and loving actions, prayer for others, and faith in God. And when we are in a tight spot, rather than getting all angry and upset or embarrassed about it, Sometimes we need to just be able to laugh at ourselves. And this is what Dayama has called letting the ego hang more loosely around the soul. <laughs> and in order to do that, we have to have some emotional distance from what's going on, don't we? If you've ever been in a play or even in a little skit and the character does something absurd, or gets into some kind of predicament, you don't go to pieces over it because you know that you're just playing a part in a play. Well, that's what we're actually doing all the time. So if we find ourselves overreacting, maybe we need to say, is it really worth getting so worked up over this? Or do I maybe need to just let go and even to be able to see the humorous side of it? It's easier on our nervous system and on our family and friends if we can do that. God does have a sense of humor, you know. And sometimes the joke is on us. <laughs> <laughs> I remember something that happened a number of years ago when I was going for the first time as an assistant to one of the senior sisters who was going to give a Sunday service at one of our meditation centers. My own assignment was a fairly light one, since it was my first time. I was supposed to play the harmonium and also lead the energization exercises before the Saturday evening meditation. And I thought, I can handle that. <laughs> and I was looking forward to quite a relaxed and inspiring weekend. Well, everything went according to plan until Sunday morning. And then this sister who was going to give the service was unable to do it. And because I was the only other monastic there, I was invited to step in. <laughs> that was a major mental adjustment, <laughs> especially since I had never given a service before. And I had heard once that Master had told Dayama in the car on the way to one of his services that she would be saying a few words and I remember thinking, it's such a good thing that things like that don't happen anymore. <laughs> well, I was wrong. <laughs> Divine Mother played a little joke on me. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was able, at least to some degree, to see the humorous side of that rather improbable situation. <laughs> And that helped me to relax enough to carry on and to do what needed to be done. 
So this world is supposed to be a drama of cosmic entertainment. And if we look at it that way and are able to sometimes even laugh at ourselves, it helps in coping with the rather unpredictable nature of it. One of you has asked, I work in an environment that can be quite negative at times. How does one deal with difficult people and conditions? Well, we know how much Master speaks about the importance of environment and the influence of it. And those of us on the spiritual path especially yearn for a harmonious and a God-centered environment. But we live in an imperfect world, don't we? And especially during these times when so many people are in stressful circumstances. Sometimes we do notice that there is a certain amount of negativity, discouragement, anger, sometimes an everyone-for-themselves kind of consciousness. But whatever our surroundings, Guruji has urged us not to let ourselves be limited or bound by them. He said, don't let anything or anyone control you. If you see that your situation is extremely detrimental to your well-being and you haven't been able to improve it, then you may need to think about finding some other kind of work, if that's an option for you. But on the other hand, if the situation is not ideal, but it's tolerable, you may feel, well, I'm lucky just to have a job. I need to hold on to it. And if that's the case, there are ways that you can counteract that environment. For example, try not to take your work problems home with you. Leave them behind as much as possible at the end of the day. And do what helps you to relax the body and the mind and seek out harmonious environments as much as you can. And it's also good to seek out spiritual company if you have the option of attending a temple or a meditation group in your area. That can help so much to remind us that there is another deeper reality besides just what's going on in daily life. But what's especially important is the attitude that we take toward our situation. Now, we can spend a lot of time getting all upset because other people don't behave as they should. And sometimes we're right. <laughs> but we can't really change anyone else, can we? We can't make them change. The one person we can change is ourself. What should my attitude be? How should I act? And if some kind of situation has come to us, there's a reason for it. There's something we're meant to learn from that environment and grow stronger through it. One of the lessons that can come through a difficult environment is developing the will and the courage to follow our own conscience. We don't have to be a chameleon and take on the color of our environment. For example, if others are gossiping, we don't need to contribute to that. Or if someone's very argumentative, we don't need to respond in the same way. Or if someone's cutting corners in their work, we can follow our own principles. It doesn't mean that we become critical or holier than thou. There are ways to be understanding and accepting of people, but without compromising our principles. And something else we can learn from a challenging environment is just how not to be too sensitive. Guruji has told us something about this from his own experiences as a boy. He said, In my youth I was very sensitive, and consequently the one who suffered most was myself. Because I was so sensitive, others seemed to take delight in getting my goat. And he explains, Don't let anyone... Get your goat. Your goat is your peace. Let no one take that away. And Master found that the more he argued with the other boys who were criticizing him, the more satisfaction they got out of it. And he discovered that if he didn't react, then they stopped taunting him. So that's a good principle to remember, isn't it? Sometimes we just care too much about what people think of us. I remember one occasion when Diamataji was talking about some general spiritual principles. 
And she said with a great deal of emphasis, it's, it's not good to be too sensitive because that only feeds the ego. And at that time I had been dwelling on something that I realized fell into the category of being too sensitive. And so I thought, I better pay attention to this. And then, later that same evening, I just happened to pick up one of her books and opened it to these words. We should overcome that sensitivity which induces hurt feelings. If our feelings are easily wounded, it simply means we are catering to our ego. So the Lord has ways of reminding us just in case we didn't get it the first time. (laughs) So the bottom line is we need to be less concerned about what others are thinking of us and more concerned about what God thinks of us. That's really what matters most. Another lesson that can come from a difficult environment is broadening our empathy and understanding of people. Now, we may not agree with someone's behavior, and we may even make a mental note not to imitate it. But if we can see them as a soul, and if we can realize they have their own struggles and their own insecurities, somehow that helps us to take what they do less personally. We realize it's not just about me. Guruji has said that we should not condone wrong actions, but he also urged us not to condemn the wrongdoer. Better to pray for them, because they need our prayers. And if you're finding it difficult to feel charitable towards someone, to say, Lord, help me to feel your love for that soul. When we pray in this way, we are not only helping them, we are also uplifting our own consciousness. And that brings us to one of the most important points Guruji has made about environment. He says, whatever be the circumstances of one's environment, it consists of both an inner world and an outer world. The outside world is the one in which your life engages in action and interaction. The world inside of you determines your happiness or unhappiness. The outer world is not always under our control, but the inner world is. We can choose what thoughts we entertain. So the best way to make ourselves invulnerable in an outwardly challenging environment is to keep the mind with God, to take Him to work with you. As Master told us, think of God as your environment. Be one with God, and nothing can harm you. And when you're in that consciousness, then you will know how best to handle every situation. The next question is also about human relationships. One of my close relatives who has had some difficult experiences in life has been holding much resentment in his heart. So I told him what Master says about the importance of forgiveness. As a result, my relationship with him has become very strained. What can I do about this? Well, many of us have family members who are not following these teachings. And because we ourselves have so much benefited from Master's principles of living, we naturally want to share them with our loved ones, especially if we see that they're having difficulty with something. And we may think, now, if they just understood this one point, (laughs) then it would be so much easier for them. And we may very well be right. But the trouble is, they may not be ready to hear it. Master cautioned against giving advice unless someone asks for it or shows some sign of receptivity. First of all, because people generally don't like to be told what to do or what to think, as you may have found out through personal experience. And secondly, the spiritual path is very individual. It's a very personal matter. And we usually have to discover spiritual truths in our own time and in our own way. 
If someone is having difficulty forgiving, they may need to get to a point where they realize my resentment is hurting me. It's eating me up from inside. And then they may be ready to look at ways to free themselves. So if a person expresses interest, then we can certainly refer them to go to G's writings and to let them know what we've found helpful ourselves. But if someone is not interested, then it's best just not to let it become an issue. To relate to the person where they are now and to accept them and treat them with kindness and love. That's what Guruji did. Those of you who have seen the film Glimpses of a Life Divine may remember a man who was not a disciple of Guruji, but he respected him very much. And he said of him, he gave me not religion, not philosophy, he gave me unconditional love. That's what changes people. Love changes people more than anything. And giving love, even in little ways, it can help to bridge that gap when you don't see eye to eye with somebody. When my family had difficulty with my interest in entering the ashram, I remember we reached a point where words alone did not help very much. And no matter how deeply I wanted them to understand, I couldn't talk them into it. I couldn't make it happen just by trying to convince them. What helped most was just to listen to them, to try to understand what they were feeling, to give love in whatever ways I could, whatever little thoughtful things I could do for them, and also to pray for them. And in time, they did begin to accept and understand more what I was doing. So people yearn to be understood, and that may be the case with the person mentioned in this question. If somebody's carrying a lot of resentment, they're probably also carrying a lot of hurt. If they feel heard, if their pain is acknowledged, and if they feel that we are not judging them, then they may be open to what we have to say. We can't necessarily change someone's views by our words, but we can love them and we can pray for them. And we can also keep striving to express Guruji's ideals in our own behavior. Sri Gyanamata wrote some very helpful advice to a devotee about this point. She said, whenever you are involved in an unpleasant situation with another person, I believe the best way of handling the matter is to decide what ought I to do? How ought I to act? Then concentrate wholeheartedly on living up to your decision, putting the other person and their actions entirely out of your mind. And she said, whenever I have lived up to this rule, I have met with surprising success. And she mentioned that whenever she tried to change the other person, nothing resulted except in harmony. She said, I maintain that holding my own consciousness on a high plane is of first importance. If I take care of that, everything else will fall into place. If our family members see us changing for the better and becoming more calm and kind and understanding, then they're more likely to say, I want to know what it is that you're doing. This next question is one that many of us might have asked at one point or another. I have been meditating for a number of years, but from time to time my mind still gets very restless and I have trouble concentrating. Do you have any advice that could help me? Well, for anyone who faces that challenge, you sure have a lot of company. <laughs> I think we can all relate to that. Everyone who tries to meditate deeply has those periods of struggle with the restless mind. It's just that our energy and attention are used to going outward, and it takes time and patience to bring that under control. And also our concentration is affected by things that are going on in our lives or things that are going on in the world. So don't be discouraged. Just keep making that effort and you will progress. The whole science of Kriya Yoga is meant to help us interiorize the mind. 
And you will find that it works if you keep practicing it and especially if you do it with reverence and with the feeling that this is a direct link with God and Guru's blessing. These are not just exercises. The Hong Sa technique is especially vital in learning to control the mind. But since you've already had a class on that, we won't go into this. But we will just mention some of the general points that perhaps can help us to be less restless. One of the common problems that devotees struggle with in their meditations is physical and mental tension. And as long as there's tension, we know that the energy is tied up in the muscles and it can't go within. And we can help to relieve that tension by taking balanced care of all aspects of our body, mind, and soul. Guruji has given a number of ways to keep the body freer of restlessness, and that, of course, helps the mind, too. One of these is physical exercise. He always encouraged the devotees, no matter how engrossed or busy they might be in their daily work assignments, in the evening he would have them go outside and exercise. So that's very helpful. He also stressed breathing deeply in the fresh air. For example, when one is walking, that brings oxygen into the body and it also helps to calm the mind. He also emphasized practicing the energization exercises morning and evening. And he did that very regularly himself, even though he was in a state of consciousness where he really didn't need to. But he set that example for us because he felt it was that important. And keeping our diet balanced also helps the body. Not having too many foods that have a lot of toxins, for example, too much sugar. Maybe going a little easier on the chocolate chip cookies and ice cream. (laughs) But if we want to concentrate better, we also need to free ourselves from mental tension. And perhaps that is the more challenging part, isn't it? And one thing that contributes to that tension, especially during these times, is the constant input that we have. It's, it's all of the sources of stimulation, the amount of information that's coming to us, the sensory stimulation, comes from all directions, voicemail, email, internet, TV, cell phones, iPods, and so forth. <laughs> And of course, these inventions all have their usefulness, but we don't want them to take over our lives. I think we all need some time just to be quiet. For example, to be out in nature without being plugged into anything. So that the mind and the nervous system and the body just have a chance to have a break from all of that input. Another major source of restlessness is worry and fear. That puts a lot of strain on the mind and heart. So if we find that we're becoming a divine worrier instead of a divine warrior, (laughs) then we may need to think, how can I reduce that load on the mind? And one way is just to do the best we can in the present and let God take care of the past and the future more. One of the nuns told me she always tries to live by the principle, this one thing I do. And that applies also to our meditations. Sometimes we think, how am I going to be able to concentrate for a whole hour? But instead think, let me just hold my mind steady on this technique just for this one moment, and then the next moment, so that you're learning to concentrate one moment at a time. So the more we can keep our body and mind relaxed overall, the better we will be able to concentrate. And when I've needed to remind myself to relax, I've found so helpful these words of Master. If you have peace in every movement of your body and peace in your thinking, peace in your willpower, peace in your love, and peace in God in your ambitions, you will know that you have connected your life with God. So as you go about your activities this week, think about that. Do I have peace in every movement of my body? And peace in my thinking? 
and peace in my willpower and my love. Just saturate your whole being with that peace and then take that into your meditations. If we're going to learn to be less restless, we also need to be patient, don't we? And that's a quality that's maybe not too much cultivated these days because we live in an instant satisfaction society. And that's one of the things that comes up so often in our spiritual efforts, that people feel impatient. When am I going to get the wonderful results that Guruji talks about in the lessons? Mm-hmm. But it's a gradual process. Have you ever sat down and tried to watch a tree grow? <laughs> well, if you did, you would be pretty frustrated very quickly. But if you take care of that tree, you see how over a number of years it becomes so beautiful and majestic. And it's the same with our spiritual efforts. We don't know how much is taking place inwardly when it seems like nothing is happening. And another aspect of that patience is not to give up, even when we feel we may not be getting results. Everyone has those dry periods sometimes when it's harder to meditate harder to love God. I remember going through one of these periods some years ago, which lasted a number of months. And when we came to the all-day Christmas meditation that year, I was deeply praying that there would be a change. And I went to the meditation with much hope and determination to make every effort. And still, for many hours, it was an uphill battle with the mind. And then during the final hour of the meditation, a sense of peace and well-being came over me that was deeper than I had felt in some time. It was as if some hidden obstacle had been removed. And that experience has always reminded me that no matter what we may think of our efforts, even if we don't think we're progressing, God receives those efforts and He will respond. In fact, Guruji said, eventually, if you keep tugging at that chain which holds you to mortal consciousness, someday a divine hand will intervene and snap it apart, and you will be free. Our final question is on introspection. Could you talk a little bit about introspection? Master emphasizes how important it is. But sometimes I get discouraged when I try to introspect. I think about all the mistakes I've made, all the habits I haven't overcome yet. Then I feel I'm not measuring up to Master's ideals and that he must be displeased with me. Well, we need to remember that introspection is meant to be a tool and not a whip. It's meant to help us take an honest look at ourselves so we can see what we need to change. But it is not meant to make us dwell on our flaws. That's really counterproductive because it only makes us identify more with them. We are not our flaws. We are the ever-perfect soul. And that's what we want to dwell on. If we're going to introspect effectively, the mind needs to be calm and not embroiled in our experiences. Guruji has told us to look at life from the balcony of introspection. I've always liked that image because it gives a sense of objectivity, of an overview. And he also refers to introspection as the ability to stand aside, to observe oneself without any prejudice and judge accurately. Now, sometimes we may not like what we see, and that's normal. But actually... Acknowledging a flaw is the first step toward overcoming it. So we don't want to get discouraged. We don't want to get into that line of thinking of, oh, I'm the only one that makes these kinds of mistakes. Nobody else does it. (laughs) You actually have more company than you think. I remember on one occasion, there was a devotee who was berating herself for making a mistake. And Dayama said to her, so you made a mistake. We'll join the rest of the human race. (laughs) making mistakes is a universal experience (laughs) I think we all know that 
And it's not the mistakes in themselves that keep us from progressing spiritually or from progressing in any area of life. It's what we do with them, whether we deal with them constructively. And I remember a little incident that made me think about how to approach mistakes in a constructive way. It took place fairly early in my life in the ashram. And when we're new at something, it's easy to do the wrong thing sometimes. And we all know how it is that when we're trying so hard not to make a mistake, that's exactly when we're more likely to make one. (laughs) And it was during one of these periods when I was somewhat mistake conscious that Dayama gave me a little porcelain figurine. And she said, this is for you as a reminder of your life here. And I looked at it, and it was a little child praying. And I thought, oh, how sweet. And then I took it to my desk, and I looked at it more closely. The little child was praying, but he was also standing in the middle of a puddle of spilled ink. And he was looking up at heaven with an expression that said unmistakably, Oh, Lord, what have I done now? (laughs) And the caption read, I am in a spot, Lord. (laughs) So it reminded me, as I said earlier, that sometimes we do need to lighten up a little. (laughs) Yes, we want to take to heart the lessons we need to learn, but not to get so emotionally involved in our mistakes that it inhibits our efforts to change. And more importantly, if we've made an error, we should never hesitate to go to God and Guru and ask their forgiveness and ask them to help us do better next time. That's part of following through on our introspection. Never think that they're going to judge you because that's just not true. When I looked at that little figurine, that child who had spilled the ink, my reaction wasn't, oh, it's so terrible, he spilled that ink. Rather, it was, well, he's made a real mess, but he's quite lovable anyway. (laughs) And I've had a feeling of empathy for that little child. And that's how God feels for us. He knows when we've slipped up. But he also sees all the good, the striving, and the potential that we have to change and do better. We know that whenever Guruji had to scold a disciple for something, as soon as they showed that they understood what they needed to learn. He was just as loving as always. He never mentioned it again. So he doesn't hold anything against us. All that God and Guru want is that we learn from our experiences. They accept us just as we are, and they see what we can become. And so we need to forgive ourselves and accept ourselves too. And the next step in following through on our introspection is to go forward and leave the past behind. Remember what Sri Yukteswar told Master, forget the past, everything in future will improve if you are making a spiritual effort now. So the key word is now. That's our window of opportunity for taking our life in a different direction, for making amends or for changing our habits. If we keep going back to the past and feeling guilty and regretting and so on, it's like driving a car with the brakes on. You're expending a lot of energy and you're not getting anywhere and you're feeling very frustrated. So that's why it's so important to feel that the past doesn't belong to you anymore. Put it behind you. Forget it. Master summarizes so beautifully in his teachings the way to overcome our human weaknesses and the pull of delusion in general. And that is not to focus on our flaws, but to focus on God. And in order to absorb these words better, let's just close our eyes and listen to what he says. The easiest way to overcome finiteness is to give oneself completely to God with the totality of one's faults and one's virtues. How quickly whatever is negative within one's character is resolved by love of God. 
Love, in a most wonderful way, transforms and spiritualizes wherever it appears. When we give our love to God wholeheartedly, we open our heart to receive his blessings. So let's turn to him without any sense of distance or fear and practice the following affirmation to remind ourselves of how much we are loved and cherished by him. I'll read it once and then we'll repeat it. O fountain of love, make me feel that my heart is flooded by thine omnipresent love. O fountain of love, make me feel that my heart is flooded by thine omnipresent love. O fountain of love, make me feel that my heart is flooded by thine omnipresent love. So take that thought with you and feel and keep God and Guru in your heart throughout this week and beyond. And you will feel their love and you will know that they are responding to you. Jai Guru, Jai Ma, Jai Ma.